There are generally different ways of securing property rights. There's private tenure, there's public tenure, but there's also customary tenure. And about 90% of rural households in Africa hold land under customary tenure. And the basic principle of customary tenure is that people gain their land rights by virtue of their membership in the community. It's a social right. They don't go to the market to purchase land. They are, in a sense, born into or inherit that right. And there's been a, a discourse that we've seen from mainly Western quarters over the decades that, well, that right is somehow inher in, 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 inherently insecure. And, and a lot of evidence now suggests that, in fact, tenure security is quite strong in the customary sector. So, so and I think there's increasing recognition, and this comes back to Tiernan's point, that underlying these customary practices is public or state ownership of those rights. And this gives the state, sometimes will be a corrupt politician or sometimes, you know, kind of pressure to make that land available to foreign investors. Uh, and so the, the kind of rights that those communities seem to enjoy can suddenly be extinguished rather arbitrarily because the underlying tenure is public land. So there's been this fabulous movement, I think it's a very important movement, uh, led by people in Africa, led by various thinkers uh, in the West, in the US, and USAID, uh, groups like Namati, wonderful NGO, that have, have been advocating for the statutory recognition of customary tenure. That, that let's, make in, let's make customary tenure in law of equal legal standing as freehold tenure and public land. And then, you know, people and communities and countries can make choices, you know, we can recognize and we can live with a plurality of, of tenure arrangements, but let's secure those customary rights. So that, for instance, if a big company wants to sort of secure land for 99 years to invest in agriculture, the folks that they would negotiate with would be those communities. And those communities, with some technical support, probably, can kind of come to those kind of agreements without feeling aggrieved and feeling that in fact they're benefiting from that. That's the first point I would make. And the second point I would make is that this article sought to make was that, you know, we talk a lot about social, economic, and political rights. And all but three countries in Africa uh, have adopted the covenant on, international covenant on social, economic, and cultural rights. Among those are rights to livelihood, rights to housing. There's not a right to land provided in that covenant. And, but importantly, the right to livelihood or the exercise of that right, the right to housing, is contingent upon land. And my argument was that, is that instead of sort of trying to create these sort of new rights to land and livelihoods and housing, let's recognize that under our feet is a system based on customary rights that provides access to land as a social right. And let's sort of embrace that as, as an achievement in something worthy of protection principally through statutory recognition of those rights.